And there is O Saraputra, an innumerable assembly of disciples with that Tanagata, purified and venerable persons, whose number it is not easy to count, with such arrays of excellences and see. In the land of bliss, in the land of or happiness, or some people call it heaven, uh, the land of, the, of, of Buddha Amitabha, uh, there is an innumerable assembly of disciples. Many people are there, many disciples are there with that Tarakata. Tarakata is the Buddha's another name for the Buddha. And all these disciples were purified and venerable persons, whose number it is not easy to count because they are infinite, immeasurable. Many, many people are there already who were born in the land of bliss, in the land of happiness. With such a race of excellences and etc. And C is the old expressions for etc. Because this sutra was translated sometime in uh, 1880, many, many years ago. So that's the old words they use. We already have finished in this sutra well, we have finished all the descriptions about the about the land of bliss, about the heaven, about land of bliss, about the land of Amitabha. How many sutras? Is the most important sutras is are there for uh, relating to Amitabha Buddha? Uh, there are basically four very important sutras that you can research into. The sutra on the Buddha of infinite life, Wulam Soji, also known as the larger. Sukhavati Vyuha. Sukhavati is land of bliss. Vyuha means a magnificent display of the land of bliss, which is the land of happiness. That's the Sanskrit word for it. And this, translated around 18, 1880, 1890, uh, was translated from Sanskrit. So it has a Sanskrit manuscript for it. And there, uh, it's also known as the larger Sukhavati Vyoha Sutra. It was translated from Sanskrit into Chinese around 220 to 265 AD, which is approximately about 1800, 1700 years ago. So in other words, the Chinese version uh, was translated 1, approximately 1750 years ago from Sanskrit into Chinese by Sangavaman. Now sometimes when we look at these things, when we look at this information, we will we have to ponder about it. Some people, a lot of scientists may say, how do I know that ancient uh, Buddhist books were actually the Buddhist teaching, were actually spoken by the Buddha? How do we know? Because all these books, most of these sutras, especially they were translated from Sanskrit into Chinese, they were done more than a thousand years ago. And how do we know that a thousand years already passed, more than a thousand years, some of them 1,800 years? How do we know that these are true sutras? How do we know, how do we prove the authenticity of these sutras? Now let me tell you, accidentally, Sometime in 18, I think late 1824, there was a British diplomat who lived in uh, Nepal. His name is Brian Hobson. Sometime in 1824 or 25, uh, he was also uh, an Indologist, uh, studied India's culture, and he discovered huge bundles of ancient manus Sanskrit manuscripts in Nepal. They excavated a lot of man and manuscripts, manuscripts, ancient manuscripts written in Sanskrit. That's about 170 years ago. They excavated a lot of these annual manuscripts and they started to study them and translate them into English. And this, this, is the English translation not from the Chinese, it's from the Sanskrit. 
So what the Chinese translated 1,700 years ago, so on the Chinese side, it was translated 1,700 years, 50 years ago. The English side was translated 150 years ago. And I tried to match them together. And they match perfectly well. That proves the authenticity of these sutras. And if you, if you search into internet, into Google, you will find um, discovery of Sanskrit manuscripts in Nepal in, the 19, in 1825 to 24, and you have a lot of information about that. There's a lot of sutras in ancient Sanskrit manuscripts excavated from the earth in Nepal by a British diplomat, Brian Hobson. When the Buddha passed away 2,600 years ago, approximately, uh, it is believed that there were two assemblies of people trying to organize the Buddhist teaching. One organized in Pali, which is now the Theravada school, uh, practiced in Burma, in Thailand, Theravada school. And it is in the Pali language. Comparatively, the, the Theravada school is relatively simpler than the, um, the Sanskrit portion. The Sanskrit is usually a royal family language. See, the philosophy is it's a little bit more sophisticated. I'm not belittling the, the Theravada school. It does not mean that the philosophy is highly profound, it's much better. Actually, Theravada contains a lot of basics and extremely important philosophy and practices that if you follow the Theravada school, it's enough to, to, to be a to be an arahat, to be the Buddha. But there's another version which is the Sanskrit version. And more and more of this excavation of Sanskrit manuscripts from the earth in Nepal prove the authenticity of the Chinese sutras. So the sutra on the Buddha of infinite life is also known as the larger Sukhavati Vyoka. The Sanskrit text is known as that, translated by Sangha Woman. Second is the Sutra on Buddha Amitayas, Amitaji, also known as the smaller Sutra. The Sanskrit text is known as the smaller Sukhavati Vyoka, translated by Kumara Jiva. Uh, in the time 300 to 420 AD, which is approximately about Again, 1,600 years ago, that is a smaller version. They also found that in the palm, the manuscript in the palm. The third, the Sutra on Contemplation of Amitayas, Guan Munak Soji, also known as Contemplation Sutra, translated by Kalayasa uh, around 420 to 600 AD, which is about 1,600, 1,500 years ago. So all these sutras related to the Amitabha Buddha were translated in various periods, but most of them were translated 15, at least 1,500 years ago. Last but not least, uh, that is the hymns of aspiration for birth, a discourse on the Amitabha Sutra. Composed by Vasubandhu around 270 to, to 350. There was a living Bodhisattva by the name Vasubandhu, a living Bodhisattva, which lived about 1,800 years ago in India. And he composed a discourse on about Amitabha Sutra encouraging later generations, later people, to practice the method composed by Vasubandhu and translated by Buddhi, uh, Buddhi in China around 420 AD, later, about 100 years later. So all these, by coincidence, we can prove they are true sutras spoken by the Buddha during the Buddhist period, and later translated. There's no question about it. And now, we already have finished, basically, the description of this land of bliss. 
or some people call it the heaven. Uh, just as a reminder, we have to understand that this land of bliss concept is very similar to a heaven concept of other religions, but in this heaven concept, the land of bliss concept, it's not just blind faith that you can be reborn in there. You have to have faith, you have to train your mind also in your mentally so that at the words of death, on death, then you can be born in that land. Not just, I believe in there's a heaven that I can go to heaven. If you believe there's a heaven that I can go to, but you're committing all kinds of evil deeds, killing, lying, fabricating, sexual misconduct, all kinds of evil conduct, then you still get into heaven? As long as you believe in heaven? That's not true. Because your karma energy will pull you down, you cannot go. You have to have, you have to have a moral foundation to be reborn in heaven. So you've got to have faith, of course, first. Faith in believing that there is heaven and faith in believing that in yourself you can go to heaven. That's faith. The second is, you have to vow to go there. You must, be, you must wish to go there. The third is, you must practice. You must train your mind to go there. What do I mean by training your mind? Let me give you an example. If, if Buddha and Mithaba say, come to my land, this is the land of happiness, where you can learn to become the Buddha, you'll be free from suffering, but you need to communicate with me. And this communication, just an example, is the email address, is the internet address. You have to get hooked up to it. You have to understand it. You have to access to it all the time. You have to have mind-to-mind -mind communication with that Buddha. And there's also other requisites for going over there. That's all contained on, in all the sutras. It's also contained in this, the smallest Sukhavati Vyoka Sutra. So, a question may come up um, asking, yes, this is a heaven concept. Um, why, why do I have to, why is it necessary for me? Because in your lifetime, in our lifetime, if you're not successful in your self-efforts to attain nirvana, to attain enlightenment, then you'll roll into the next path of reincarnation again. Then you'll, you'll take another form again in the next life, being pulled by your karma. You'll reincarnate into the sixth round of reincarnation again. You may, may, you may reincarnate into the animal realm, hell realm, human realm, azure realm. So we don't know. We, we're not sure whether we can be born in heaven. So in order to be sure, you have to know how to do it. Not just believing that I can go to heaven and that's it. You have to know, how do I get there? What are the prerequisites of getting there? This is what the sutra is. And I would like to say something about the descriptions of the land of bliss of Amitabha. Because Vasubandhu, one of the pioneers, one of the living Bodhisattvas, living in around 300 ADs, which is about 1,800 years ago, he's also the pioneers of the school of consciousness only, which Nalamada gave a detailed description of Amitabha's pure land. So I would like to pull from other sources how other Bodhisattvas describe Amitabha's pure land other than what the sutras talk about. He followed the larger sutra, the larger sutra Vatibhyuka, and some other sutras and composed the hymn of Aspiration for Birth, a discourse on Amitabha Sutra. Uh, Vasubandhu's descriptions of his of experiences is threefold, and each division has various aspects. So in his discourse, it contains three sections. 17 aspects, 8 aspects, and 4, we call it 29 aspects. 17 aspects on descriptions of the pure land, 8 aspects on Amitabha's physical manifestation, and 4 aspects on the Bodhisattva's dwelling in the pure land. Um, I'd like to bring this out to you so that from the perspective of a living Bodhisattva, 
who lived 1,800 years ago to about 700 years after the death of Buddha, after the Mahapari Nirvana Buddha. There was a living Swadhisattva who highly advocated uh, the concept of the land of bliss and advised people who must go there. Because if you're not successful in this life, particularly in later generations, where people are extremely busy with their pursuit of material wants, it's extremely difficult for them to, to, be, to get enlightened, to be the Buddha in this lifetime, in her lifetime. So it's better to go into that land of bliss after death and learn in that land to become the Buddha. Three from worldly sufferings. Some people may not find it important. What do I care when I die? <laughs> I got nothing to left. When I die, I forget about everything. If you believe that when you die, that's the termination of you, period, you blindly be, be, believe in nihilism. That's not, that's not the right belief. When a person dies, it's not the end of you. Death is the beginning of another life. If you have not gotten enlightened, you'll roll into the next path of reincarnation again. You came from the previous life. Time is just as one life. Time is a continuation. It's a whole vast horizon of time spent. You, you, you develop from thousands and millions of previous life into this life. You have accumulated a lot of karma in previous life. Bad and good karma. Mostly bad. Why? Because if you accumulate only good karma, you'll be reborn in heaven already. And heaven, that concept of heaven is not the ultimate way to go. Because you still reincarnate after you enjoy happiness in heaven. But Amitabha's land is the land of bliss. In there, you, you will not retrogress into this world, world of desires again. So let's explore into the 17 aspects, 18, 8 aspects and 4 aspects, 29 aspects as developed by the teaching of Vesubandhu. The pure land is the realm of purity above various states of existence in samsara, which are defiled and delusory. Our existence is defiled, which means that we have a lot of mental afflictions. Who gave us these mental afflictions? Why am I becoming so jealous? Why do I have jealousy, hatred, anxiety, fear, envy, fraudulence, ignorance, ignorance? Um, why, do I, why, do, why do I have all these mental afflictions? Is it because of other people who give it to me? You generated it yourself. You're the master of your own faith. You did all these things that brought forward. Your karma have brought all these things forward to you and during this life. What you have gone through is actually all the causes were in your previous life. Don't, don't blame any, anybody for it. Don't blame the society. Don't blame God. Don't blame your parents for what you have got. You did it all by yourself. And this is a world of sufferings and defilements and delusion. By saying that, we do not mean that we despise this world. We do, we do not mean that we are very pessimistic. We know this is a world of suffering, but we want to change it. We want to be away from it. Second, the pure land is vast and boundless, like empty space. Third, it has originated from great compassion and super mundane goodness. It's from the goodness of Amitabha, who made the vows when he was practicing as a layman. He made the vows that I will go through all this practice, and when I become successful, I will create this land of bliss for people to come, like a university, where you can learn to become the Buddha. But first, you must be away from suffering first. Amitabha created that world. And that world is many, many millions of miles away from here to the West. It's just like this temple, for example. This temple 30 years ago was a piece of agricultural land on which there's no single, not a building stands on. It's just a piece of dirt. How come this piece of dirt now has 
magnificent temples standing on top of it. Isn't that some powers? Isn't there some supernatural power or some abilities of something to make it come true? 30 years ago, when we were sitting on this piece of land, we could not imagine that so many, all these buildings could be to exist in here. It's just like, how could you imagine that to the West, there's a paradise, there's a pure land exist that accepts you into there, free from suffering. 30 years ago, nobody would believe that this will be a temple in here. I have witness to this. Because I built it 30 years ago from a piece of dirt, nothing on it. We started from a thought. We wanted to build a temple in here. And that thought develops into a miracle. We started to collect money from all sources. And we've done it for 30 years. The first 10 years, one building. Another five years, another building, another five years, another building. Plus all the interior decorations. When I came to think of it, oh, how come we have achieved this? If I had to go back, I, I, I got scared of doing something like this. I've gone through a lot of sufferings of doing this. A lot of efforts have been applied to it. I've overcome a lot of hurdles. We, not I, we have overcome a lot of hurdles. We have overcome a lot of difficulties to achieve something like this. It's just like Amitabha Buddha had gone through a lot of hurdles to create that land of bliss millions of miles away to the west. You may not believe it. Just as a person may not believe the direction of all these buildings 30 years ago sitting in this piece of dirt. But it came true. You understand what I mean? So let's carry on. It is suffused with pure light in the land of bliss. It is full of exquisite adornments. Its brilliant light illuminates the whole world. Jewel ornaments give delightful sensations to those who touch them. Jewel flowers fill the ponds. There are majestic towers and brilliant trees and decorated nets hang in the sky. It's just like when you are reading these lines from there, you will think, why all this flowery language describing magnificence and excellences of the pure land? I couldn't imagine it. But then, 30 years ago, when we were sitting in here with, with a piece of bare land, we couldn't imagine that we have the statues in here. We couldn't imagine that we have this marble floor. We couldn't imagine that the ceiling is that high. We couldn't imagine not a single thing in here. Flowers and ornament groups fall from the sky. The Buddhist wisdom is like the sun that dispels the darkness of the world. The sacred name which enlightens living beings is heard throughout the ten quarters. Amitabha presides over and sustains the land. That means the, the professor, the leader, the leading professor is Amitabha. There's so many assistant professors and associate professors, so many tutors in there. It's like a university. In there, You'll be reborn in there after you die in here, and you'll be learning to become the Buddha in there. When you become the Buddha, you're the same as Amitabha. In other words, there's not always a, a professor and student relationship. There's not always a, a master and slavery, or, or, or a master and a follower relationship. When you, when you are in there as a student, but when you get complete enlightenment, you are the Buddha. Because that nature is in you, you are the same, we're all one. No discrimination. Bodhisattvas are born miraculously from the flowers of Amitabha's enlightenment. They always enjoy the Buddha Dharma and do all the meditation. They are free of afflictions and always enjoy happiness. The pure land is the realm of the Mahayana merit and those born there are free of mental and physical handicaps and imperfections. All the aspirations are fulfilled. In other words, when we passed away, everybody has to pass away. There's no exception. If you passed away, instead of rolling into the next life and death of reincarnation, next round, changing your body again into another body, don't change into reincarnation anymore. 
free from the reincarnation. Because if you are reincarnation, you always suffer. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, suffering arising from death of beloved ones, suffering arising from living with hated ones, suffering arising from unending desires, suffering from all sorts of outer environments like earthquake, tsunami, hurricanes, starvation, wars, human wars, genocides, all kinds of suffering. You will be away from these sufferings if you are reborn in there. But you really have to train your mind so that at the, at the words of dying, you won't get, get confused. Because most people at the, at, at the words of dying, they get confused from, from painful suffering. If, you, if the mind is confused, you can't go there. So you have to have the training now. Do not wait until you die. As long as when I die, I chant Amma Amitabha and I will be successful in there. It's not so. Because you have to train up your mind that you, have to, that you can go there when you die, when we die. Okay, I finished the 17 aspects. And uh, next time I will continue. Um, this concept of the land of bliss is an expedient practice, which means that other than practicing meditation, depending on your self-efforts, you have to rely on the Buddhist efforts too. It's a self and other reliance. It's both ways. Don't just rely on yourself. Rely on also the Buddha's ability. So if you really want to compare the Buddhist teaching to other, uh, other teaching, the only similarity is in here. The land of bliss concept or the heaven concept. You can go to the heaven. But that's only one of the many methods uh, given by the Buddha. There are other methods too. But this is an expedient means. So this is to get guarantee that you won't be reborn in another samsara, in another land of reincarnation.